Hi, everyone. Wow, what an amazing audience you are. Um, so for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about the rather sticky issue that is sex and data. But first, I want you to imagine you're in a bar or a party, perhaps even the next web party tomorrow, and you lock eyes with the hottest person in the room. You smile at them, they smile back. You go over and start talking to them. There's incredible chemistry between you. Maybe a few beers down the line, or perhaps a bottle or two of wine. You reach for that courage, and you lean in, and you go for the kiss, and they hand you a 60-page contract. It's nothing serious, they say, just some terms and conditions for our relationship. It explains things like the secrets that you might divulge to them, how they'll handle those secrets, that kind of thing. Just flip to the end, they say, and sign your name. Then we can have that kiss. Would you do it? In sexual relationships, consent is the most important thing. Going beyond that, as we say within the sex industry and the BDSM and fetish communities, you must obtain informed, enthusiastic consent. Everyone needs to understand what's going on, what the limits or the boundaries are, and make an active choice to go ahead. Consent. It's simple, right? But when it comes to software, many companies will ask for something quite different. They'll ask for agreement. And agreement is not the same as consent. To agree or not to agree, that is the question. Or at least it's the question PayPal should be asking you. Its user agreement is almost the same length as Shakespeare's Hamlet, 28,000 words to Shakespeare's 30. And this isn't an isolated case. Can I ask how many of you have an Amazon Kindle or have used one? Quite a few people. Keep your hands up if you have read its user agreement. I'd be incredibly impressed if you had. Two months ago, an Australian consumer group read the Amazon Kindle terms and conditions aloud, and it took them nine hours. Nine hours. 73,000 words. Can you really give informed consent to thousands of words of legal jargon that you probably don't understand? And can you really be that enthusiastic about it when it would probably bore you half to sleep? Some companies will now even ask you to read and tick a box before you can even use their product. But of course you don't. You just scroll to the bottom and you tick the box, don't you? At least that's what I do, really badly. If this was sex, we'd call this kind of agreement compliance or even coercion. It's essentially saying, if you want this kind of relationship with me, you have to give me that. And nobody wants that in their bedroom. So, for those of you I haven't met yet, um, like we're saying, my name is Stephanie, I'm co-founder of Mystery Vibe, and we make smart sex toys. And because this sex is still such a taboo, sex tech companies have very different challenges when it comes to building a business. Uh, young sex tech startups, for example, will have difficulty finding a bank or a payment processor. And we really struggle with advertising. We battle with advertising platforms to show our ads even to adults. And we also have a huge challenge when it comes to handling user data. We're held to a higher standard, which makes total sense, right? I mean, we're not talking about your favorite song or your brand of toothpaste here. User data from sex toys could include things like how, when, where you masturbate or have sex with your partner. It's the kind of stuff you don't even talk about in real life. So we're in this really intimate relationship with people who use our products. And because of that, we need something far more substantial than agreement. We need consent. So what kind of data are we actually talking about? And what is a smart sex toy? Well, smart sex toys are products that are connected to the internet or via an app. They can often be controlled remotely, perhaps offer customized experiences, or maybe interact with other apps or smart objects in your smart home. There are so many possibilities. It's such a young industry. And in a world where the sex tech market will be worth $50 billion by 2020, you should be able to get a lot of bang for your buck. So in the process of getting you off just how you like it, um, sex toys can collect different types of data. They can collect usage data, so what settings you use and when, internal temperature for diagnostics, that kind of thing. 
They can collect customer data, so tying that to a profile, which allows you to save preferences, perhaps even share them with your partner or with the world if you're that way inclined. Or other things like visual and audio, which is very rare at the moment, but as VR and robotics get much more advanced, we'll see a lot more of this creeping in. It sounds scary, right, that a product might know so much about your sexual tastes and habits, but it's also very easy to forget that this data has an incredibly useful purpose. So let's go back to that hot person in the bar that you met. If you want to have good sex with them, and I mean good sex, at some point, you're going to need to communicate with them. Perhaps you'll need to tell them where and how you like to be touched, guide their hands, listen to their instructions so you can reciprocate, that kind of thing. And this intimate personal data is what will drive the smart in smart sex toys. It will allow users to save their settings, create unique pleasure profiles. Essentially, you'll be able to train the toy what you like, when you like, and exactly how to give you the good stuff. Great when you're on your own, great when you're on your own, but also fantastic if you want to show your partner how to please you in bed, for example. So far, so obvious, right? A little bit less obvious, but also quite interesting, is that this kind of data will allow us to improve our products. So deliver you better features, make products more pleasurable, that kind of thing. It's like any other part of tech. The more you know your customer, the better you can create and design products that will fit exactly what they want. Going even further, aggregate data, if you anonymize it, could help us to understand more about broader sexual habits and preferences. It will help researchers and help us understand sexuality, educate people, and start to break down some of those taboos and stigmas around sex that I was talking about. It's like sex itself, right? If you communicate what you like, you're gonna have better sex. And if we all communicate what we like, society becomes much more educated, much more comfortable around sex, and some of the shame and embarrassment around the topic will begin to disappear. But there are risks. Just as there are risks with going home with someone after the next web party tomorrow night. You need to be sure that they're not going to go on Facebook and start spilling all of your juicy little secrets once you've left the room. And when sex toys get hacked, you can pretty much guarantee three things. One, it will make mainstream news. Guarantee it. Two, there will be some real knee-jerk reactions. Things like, well, maybe you don't need a Wi-Fi connected sex toy. Of course it got hacked. Just steer clear of those kinds of products. And three, you can pretty much guarantee that someone somewhere will use some kind of pun to do with penetration testing and think that they're being all original. Trust me, it's not original. The joke has been made many, many times. But to me, this knee-jerk reaction seems a little bit weird. I mean, let's apply it to other areas of tech. Does the fact that we have online fraud mean that we no longer use internet banking or things like TransferWise? Of course it doesn't. And when the National Health Service was hacked last week in the UK, where were all the articles saying, well, doctors should go back to using pens and papers, they shouldn't keep patients' records online, what are they doing? And when it comes to sex, we really don't like being told what to do. I mean, you remember that celebrity nude hack that happened a while back on iCloud? Did that mean that we stopped sharing naked selfies with each other? Of course it didn't. Now, this isn't to say that the risks don't matter. Of course they do. And sex tech companies like ours have a huge job to do to establish user trust. But that job will be done much better and much easier if we focus on consent, not agreement. Informed, enthusiastic consent. So what does this mean for a company like ours? Well, at the moment, you can connect our products to an app which allows you to personalize them, to live control with your partner, and we're sneaking in a little update either today or tomorrow that will let you to create your own vibration patterns so you can essentially program our vibrators. It's like a platform. We have long distance control in our pipeline, so to be able to control a product from this country, say, to another. 
Um, but where things get really interesting for us is when we start to connect our products up to the Internet of Things, to smart objects. So if you imagine uh, you walk home, you come home with your partner or perhaps with your date, and you walk into your bedroom and the lights dim to just the right amount, maybe they change color, we could curate you an amazing music playlist on Spotify that we know will get you just in the right mood, or perhaps some visual content that we can send to you on your smart TV, or it could be something as simple as changing the temperature in your bedroom so that when you get home, it's not too cold and you don't not want to take your clothes off, that kind of thing. But it's impossible for us to do this without data. And some of the more exciting things around sex tech that I was talking about earlier, like virtual reality and robotics, you need a huge amount of user data. You can't personalize something if you don't know what people like. And for that, you need that data. So as we move into this very digitally connected sex toy world, we're starting to think about how we might handle this kind of data in the future once we start collecting it. And I'd like to share our initial thoughts with you today. So we believe that when it comes to data and privacy, a company's relationship with its customers should be based on three things. Communication, consent, and commitment. First up, communication. Customers should know exactly how their products work in simple, clear language, upfront. This is the data we're collecting, this is where we store it, and this is how we use it. That includes the risks, of course, but it also includes the benefits. Far from being a dirty secret, data is a vital tool that delivers key features of smart sex toys. It's what makes us different to that battery-powered rabbit you probably have in your bedside drawer back home. So far, so simple. The second point, consent, needs a little bit more explanation. We've already informed you, but now we need to seek an active, enthusiastic choice, not tacit agreement, a genuine choice from you. Now, if someone is nervous about the risks of sharing data, they should be able to use their smart sex toy as a dumb one, essentially switching off any smart feature that collects any data. So if someone wants to go to first base, we should respect that. Or they could choose to go further. They could go to, let's call it, second base. They could use some of the smart features, but opt out of data sharing. Do not share any of that data beyond the bedroom, not with the company, not with anyone. All of that data is in this closed loop system that is connected to your phone and the product. This will allow them to have some of those smart features, things like storing some of your preferences, but it won't allow you to do things like upgrade, improve, and learn from the cloud. Now, there are still some risks with this option. It's important to note. For example, someone could hack your phone directly, and they could access your profile, just like they could go on your Facebook and start posting weird and crazy and awful things. But if we go back to communication, the important thing is that we tell users how to mitigate those risks. So use secure passwords, non-identifiable email addresses, those kinds of things. Well, what if someone wants to go all the way? Get all the features of the smart sex toy that I was talking about, including upgrades, improvements, um, all of that content. In this case, people will need to share more. They need to share more data with us, and all of that data is potentially hackable. We can inform them about the risks, but today, let's be honest, we live in a world where it's impossible to call something unhackable. An interesting way of solving this might be a little bit controversial. Do you remember that I said one of the main benefits of sharing data was to help medical professionals and researchers understand more about sex? Well, a little bit like the Genome Project, we could ask the customers who want to use this option if they're happy for us to publish their data and make it public. Now, don't freak out about this. It would all be anonymized, non-identifiable, no emails, no names, just dots and charts as part of broader data sets around sex toy usage. Now, like I say, it's impossible to call something unhackable. But if you anonymize and publish data, you would save people from a pretty nasty surprise if the worst came to the worst. You'd also pretty much make the hack pointless. The data would already be out there already. And crucially, the people who had said, yes, I want to do this, have consented, and they know exactly what data is being shared. They know it's 
why it's being shared and how it's being stored. And if that scares you, that's okay. I know not everyone in this room would be happy to share their data with the world. That's totally fine. But if we've done our job correctly, only the people who have chosen this option would be in that category. And each of these options is indeed a choice. And we think companies should operate this way when it comes to consumers. Give them a choice, let them choose, and respect that choice. So there you go. Commitment. Now, the final point here is that we've been pretty passive. We've been giving you the options. We've been letting you choose. But any good relationship is a two-way thing. And as a company, we need to commit to continuously improving security and communication around these issues. It also means that we need to assume that people can and probably will try to use our products and data in ways that we did not intend, and we must plan for this. We must create contingency. When you hear about hacks, and I'm talking much more broadly here, it's very easy to assume that the company hasn't worked hard enough to prevent it. But what consent means is that we make users aware which risks we can remove and which ones we can't, and we let them make their own minds up. So, communication, consent, and commitment. This is our approach. And we'd like to see more people thinking about this as companies, but also as consumers. Ask yourselves, when you're buying a new product, is this something I want? Am I informed about this? Do I understand what I'm giving away in terms of my data? Do I agree with this, or do I truly consent? And consent isn't just a, oh, OK, I guess I better tick this box if I want to use this product. It's about being offered a choice, not just whether you use something, but also how you use it. It's an ongoing commitment between a company and a customer, continually listening to each other, responding to each other, and respecting each other's choices, just like sex. Consent is not the absence of a no, but the presence of an informed, enthusiastic yes. So to conclude, um, as a pleasure brand, we are in a very unique position. People take our products into their bedrooms, and they could potentially share data with us that they wouldn't share with anyone else in their lives. So we have to respect that. We tell them exactly how their products work, what data they're collecting, and what it's not. We tell them how they can minimize risk, as well as what we're doing to minimize it on our side. And we give them an active choice. But the vital final piece of the puzzle that really turns agreement into consent is the understanding that people will make different choices. In the kink community, there's a saying, your kink is not my kink, but your kink is OK. And it broadly means, I may not enjoy the same things as you, but I respect your right to enjoy it. And that's what is the foundation of a good relationship. You respect a no, you respect a not right now. But as a society, we should also respect a yes. We need to respect the person who goes home with that hot person they met at the bar tomorrow at the next web, respect them, as well as the person who goes in for a kiss and then maybe swaps numbers. We respect the person who says, not tonight, I'm not feeling it tonight. But we also respect the person who is halfway home in a taxi getting a little bit steamy. Some people will decide that smart sex toys are not for them. And that's OK. Some people will maybe want to go to second base instead of third base, if you like. But many people will say, hell yeah, give me all you've got. They will choose to explore new avenues of sexual pleasure, understanding the rewards as well as the risks. And we should celebrate that and respect them. So the final thought I want to leave you with today is agreement is about trying to get a yes. And consent is about asking, what do you want? And respecting all answers equally. Which would you prefer? Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Stephanie Alice.